Hi, I'm uh, David Sundelius. I'm here today to talk to you about technical agility. I'm a technical agile coach at uh, ProAgile, um, and I work here in Gothenburg with the organizations to uh, to make them more lightweight and more uh, easy to change. Okay, so why am I an agile coach at a development conference? Isn't that weird? Aren't we just the uh, guys who tell you to to stand up during your morning meetings and uh, report your story points in Jira? Uh, yeah, uh, I think some of you know what I mean. Uh, for me, that's not agile coaching at all. Uh, I'm a software engineer from Chalmers from the beginning. Uh, I studied uh, um, computer science, algorithms, logic, and languages here, and uh, I focused on compiler construction, so more of the metal hard stuff here. Uh, but when I got out in the industry, uh, all of my code suddenly... I worked as a front-end developer and architect for a while, and uh, but I noticed most of the things I did didn't actually create the value I wanted from for the customer because everything around in the organization hindered me from doing what I really did well. Uh, and that's exactly the same thing that, the, uh, that founded the Agile Manifesto. The, the people who, who uh, built this movement, uh, they thought that we developed uh, software in the wrong way. Uh, we worked... Uh, by doing a lot of documentation, and we, we focused on how to, uh, to get our processes to work as, as uh, good as possible, like uh, optimizing a, a assembly line or something like that. That kind of defeats the purpose of, of agility, and, uh, and it uh, strangles the innovation and creativity of the programmers. Uh, we have studied a lot of, of, uh, of, of time, and we, we can think about these kinds of stuff, so let us just do the work. That was the the founding energy of what drive driven the what have driven the agile development since. Uh, so this is the agile manifesto. It's uh, it's not called the uh, the agile methods or agile uh, process or something like that. This is a manifesto. It's something we want to change within the the industry of software development. Uh, so uh, we think that uh, the things to the left here are more important. The things to the right may have some sort of value, but the things to the left are the things that are important for, for us inside of this industry. Uh, we can use processes and tools. Uh, they can be great, but we need to focus on, on individuals and interaction. And, and if we don't think that we are using the right software uh, methods or the right uh, tools for, for the purpose, that's changed that, that. The important thing is that we take uh, care of the individuals and interactions. Uh, all the great uh, comprehensive documentation in the world can't uh, create value for a customer unless we have some sort of working product. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to, to uh, focus on having a working software and uh, remove some part of the, of the comprehensive documentation. That could include all your old uh, BSTS tasks or, uh, or requirement documentation or something like that. So it's more important, important with the uh, working software. Uh, and also the last one, uh, we need to... Doing a plan is, is a good thing. Uh, we can plan some, store, some stuff and we can try to plan thing, things, but uh, if something in the environment changes, we need to be able to respond to change. Uh, so when we work with organizations, we, we usually try to divide agility into three different parts. Uh, the first one is the business agility. So this is uh, learning from the customer and from the environment and changing our business models accordingly. Uh, so, for instance, if we are so a company that's great on building um, analog cameras and the, the industry doesn't want that anymore, we need to, the business agility is the rate that we can change direction for our business to go more towards, um, more towards a new age for digital cameras, for instance. Um, the organizational agility, here's where, where Scrum, if you have heard about that, uh, that is where, where that falls into. It's how we work, how we can uh, work together, and uh, how we can change the organization uh, to, to fit the environment's needs. And the last one I think I'm going to talk about is the technical agility. That is the purpose of this speech. Uh, all of these things are necessary. If we don't address the technical agility, we will have a lot of problems, and the organization won't actually be able to be as agile as you want, to want it to be. Uh, but we can't uh, only do the technical agility either. We probably need to change something about how the business works as well. So what is technical agility then? 
I define it as how well a technology and the development teams work to support fast and easy and smooth changes within a, uh, within a product to increase the value for the customer. So how the, the actual value for the customer is usually created by changing something from what we have today because the world are is uh, constantly changing. So uh, we need to be able to change it. And the rate at which we can do those changes are important for, for technical agility. Uh, the way we do usually do this within organizations is uh, that I try to help teams to simplify their own uh, their own way of writing, their own processes, their their uh, things that they are using, uh, and we try to remove waste such as uh, unnecessary or uh, unnecessarily long meetings uh, or uh, stuff like that, and we try to to do whatever we can to optimize the time that it takes from one person within an organization or a user or a developer to to take the something from an idea out to concrete value for the user. I'm not going to talk about any best practices. I really don't like that, uh, that description, because uh, if we had best practices, then we could probably automate away everything, right? If we knew exactly the answer to everything, then we, could we don't need developers for that. Uh, so these are just experimental ideas. I hopefully will have some idea you can try within your organizations when you get away from this speech. Okay. So has anyone read this book before, The Clean Code? So some of you have. It's a great book. Uh, it, uh, it is written by one of the, the original authors of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, it uh, handles how to write good code that is readable for other humans. Uh, because when I s sit down and write code, the most time I spend is not actually tapping the keyboard. It's reading other people's code, creating a model inside of my head on how to how the system works and where I can modify it to uh, do the thing I want. Or reading my own code as well. Uh, that could probably be worse sometime. Uh, but uh, when, uh, when trying to write the code, the important thing is not to get the computer to, to actually understand what you're writing, because that is the, the easy part. The hard part is to, to actually get uh, get the, auth the next person reading it to create that model in their head as fast as, fast as possible. Um, and also, we would try to uh, refactor our code uh, a bit often, because if we don't refactor code once in a while, uh, the environment will have changed in some way uh, that that code is not really uh, useful anymore, or that its, uh, its original purpose has changed at least. So we should try to refactor as often as we can. And also, the Boy Scout rule uh, is an important takeaway from this book, I think. Uh, it's uh, whenever you get to a code uh, and you do a modification, uh, you try to, to leave it a bit little bit better than, than it was before. Uh, in that way, we can increase the quality of the code all over the code base. So this is actually the thing that uh, slows down most organizations uh, in, in technical agility as well. So here we have... Uh, some sort of dependencies between teams. I can give you an example from last week when I talked uh, to a development team I work with. Uh, they sat in a meeting and we were just about to decide on our highest top priority thing, uh, what we are going to, what way we are going to do, uh, what technology we are going to use to, to solve a specific problem. And uh, they were just about to decide when someone said, but what about this team? They are working on, on, on this kind of thing as well. And everyone just sat back in the chair, okay, we wait for them. Uh, and that is kind of a usual thing. Uh, we we need something from someone else, and then we can just relax and uh, and not focus on our top priority. But that meant that we will have to wait for for something to be done. So if we want to have fast changing products, we need to be able to to handle most of the dependencies ourselves within our our team. To do that, we first. Uh, try to organize in cross-functional teams, uh, like we have every competence needed uh, to be able to to deliver a whole product from an idea to value, so we don't have any dependencies outside. Uh, and we try to identify all the, the dependencies and try to motivate why they are there, because some dependencies can bring value, uh, like for instance, if we need some sort of shared uh, graphical profile for a whole product or something, that could bring value of some way. But we need to, to uh, measure that against uh, our technical agility, because we need to know that uh, if we if we have this dependency, then we will be slower on changing things in the future. 
and if possible, it's an agile team's uh, purpose to try to get more autonomous and try to break off uh, existing dependencies. So if you can, try to eliminate those. Uh, this is the Kinefin framework. It's uh, a way to categorize uh, a specific problem. If we're over here, uh, it's some sort of obvious problem. We have a problem, and we can identify that problem, and we can just do the best practice way of, uh, of solving that problem, and we will we'll know that we have the correct result afterwards. For instance, brushing my teeth, teeth or uh, um, doing the dishes. I, if I do the exact same thing uh, every time, the exact same result will come out of it. The next one is uh, complicated problems. They can be like um, a manufacturing line, an assembly line. Uh, we know we need to have some sort of uh, knowledge about how to create one, and we need to plan that. But I when we have done the plan, we can just execute it, it, execute it, and it can get repeatable results in some way. Uh, so that we need some good practices. We can we can uh, try to see the goal, and we can plan towards the goal and execute. Then we go to the complex ones. Uh, for instance, if you have a customer that comes to you and they want a computer system of some sort, they usually don't have the com complete system in their head because if they had that, they could just write it down and, and uh, make it, right? There are a lot of technical uh, things to choose from in, in all of these, and we don't know the co correct result in the end. So we can't do the complete architecture in the beginning. Instead, we try to do a minimum amount, amount of architecture in the beginning, try to uh, and to try to scale that up afterwards. Uh, for instance, if we want a great service uh, that that has uh, hundreds of service workers, backend uh, workers in some way, we can start by using one and try to to have one customer using this and then scale it up instead of trying to build the architecture perfect from the beginning, because we need to change that probably afterwards anyway. High-level automation. This is uh, probably basic knowledge for for all of you, uh, since you're working with uh, open source. But um, we try to automate as as everything as uh, as much as possible. Everything from from testing, uh, like the unit tests down there, and the integration tests and E2E tests and end tests. Uh, but also things like uh, environment creation and. Uh, and to be able to run a correct production environment on each computer that for the developers are, are essential to be able to try out things uh, and to be able to test things from a correct perspective. It also simplifies a lot of things afterwards. Uh, if we can repeat all of these steps uh, on our own computers, then we will be able to, to find bugs faster and we will be able to troubleshoot things easier. Operational excellence. Uh, First of all, uh, DevOps is a, is a movement as well. Uh, it was created after Agile, but uh, for me, it has always been kind of hard to distinguish between, between them because you can't do Agile without DevOps, is my hypothesis. Uh, all the dev DevOps uh, says that the Dev and Ops should be in the same team, uh, like Agile does, uh, but we, I say that they should probably be the same people as well. Uh, one person should be able to, within a team, should be able to do both Ops tasks and the Dev tasks. Uh, and uh, this uh, DevOps thinking is uh, to shift the mindset from our system should never fail in production until uh, to change it to we need to be able to recover fast. We need to, uh, to be able to, if something fails, which we know it will in some cases because we can't create bug-free code. So if, uh, if it will fail at some point, we need to be able to recover that fail faster, faster than normal. So instead of optimizing uptime, we need to minimize the mean time to recovery. Uh, Netflix has done a, a cool thing there. Uh, they are using something called chaos monkey testing. This is uh, where they place a service in their, in their system, and that service only purpose is to bring down other services. So they in production, they pull down random services at random times. And uh, the, the way they're doing this, uh, why they're doing this, is that they need to check uh, that they can fast recover all the services and that nothing is a single point of failure in the system. And if, if it is, then they won't notice it unless it's in production. So they need to be able to fix it fast. So that is an extreme case of, uh, of trying to minimize mean time to recovery instead of maximizing uptime. Uh, as well as uh, the team uh, working together, we are usually working uh, with uh, 
with agile teams in some way. And we try to both have them cross-functional, as we talked about earlier, and also try to make each individual have be some sort of T-shaping. Normally, we, we are educated like uh, testers or UX specialists or back-end developers or front-end developers. Uh, in, in a way, when we are, if someone, if, if a team only has one back-end developer, for instance, and that person is sick, then we will have a problem to deliver all the things that we need to do, and we need to start waiting, and the waiting is the thing we want to avoid. Uh, so what we're trying to say instead is that within a team, you should have some sort of T-shaping. So these over here are your skill levels and different kinds of tasks. So if you're a back-end developer, this might be Java or something, or Go or something like that. Uh, and this up here could be UX uh, user testing or something. So everyone should be able to do a little bit of everything, uh, but be specialized in their task. Uh, in that way, we can sort of create uh, more agility in the organization. Uh, the way we can create T-shipping is uh, by pair programming or mob programming. Uh, my team that I'm working with right now, they are mob programming 100% of their time. It's uh, really, uh, so more prog programming, if you haven't heard about it, is that the whole team sit down in front of a screen and one person is writing. Seems fairly inefficient, right? Uh, the thing is that uh, they are all uh, giving their feedback on the code right away. They won't have uh, to send all these uh, pull requests for from each other, They're sitting r right next to each other, and they can give feedback directly. Uh, so they won't, they don't produce as much of uh, bugs or uh, or things that needed to be corrected, and they create code that is readable right from the start. So that's not for everyone, but uh, for some people it works really well. Uh, they also have innovation days, where they have uh, uh, Fridays each second week. They can do whatever they want with whatever, uh, with whoever they want. So customer service and. Uh, and uh, some developer could go together and create an internal app for the company for doing something. Uh, the, only, the only thing with these days is that they have to show at the end of the day what they've done for the entire organization. Uh, in that way, they have created a lot of great innovative stuff uh, that can be used to create new business ideas or new, uh, new ways to simplify the, their uh, normal work life. Have you seen the, the measurements up there sometime? Lines of code per developer, uh, number of bugs reported in a system, or number of story points delivered versus story points estimated. Uh, I've been measured on these as a developer. Uh, it uh, was kind of easy as an engineer to find cool ways to optimize these uh, without actually creating any value at all. Uh, like writing a lines of code is probably the worst one because uh, then I can write a lot of code that actually only destroys the system and, uh, and don't create any value. So if I'm getting paid based on how many lines of code I'm writing, then, uh, then I, will I will create just uh, shit code instead. Uh, instead, we should be able to, to look at these three instead. Uh, they could be could be possible measurements. Throughput is the, the number of valuable increments that you make. Uh, for instance, uh, like a user story, if that user story is written in a way that it actually brings value to the customer. So how many, many items you make, however big or however, however, however small they are, uh, if, uh, if we optimize on this, we will break down our tasks into smaller pieces and that will be able to, then we will be able to release things off more often. So that is a good, if we try to game this one, it actually gets better anyway. So, so that's a good thing. The lead time is the one I talked about in the beginning. From idea to, to actual value for the customer, try to minimize that time. And the cycle time is the idea uh, that from that the development team starts working on something until it's done. So try to minimize that time and uh, minimize waiting time, actually. Okay. Uh, so. These are the, uh, the seven things I've talked about. Clean code, try to lower the level of external dependencies, try to do emergent architecture design, high level of automation, try to make the, your ops working really well, uh, try to make the team learn things faster together, and to try to measure the right things. 
And uh, if we can do these things as developers, we can increase the, develop the agility of org our, our organizations, and that will probably create better working environments for all of us, I think. Uh, so I want us developers to actually bring back the great, uh, the spirit of, of agility instead of talking about it like a management principle. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, hi. So uh, I'm not sure I completely understood about uh, your emergent architecture mm -hmm. uh, slide because it was uh, that one. Yep. I mean, to me, uh, I didn't see how it's actually about architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what I saw missing, uh, or, or I don't know if uh, what's your opinion on this, is you cannot be fast and you cannot deliver value. Uh, so you can have uh, very good throughput and everything. Mm -hmm even if you write uh, user nice user stories, which is very important. But uh, to me, if your system is not made in a way that can be uh, experimented, so you can create experiment features, so you can create new innovation, and you can do it fast, you, can, you will still be slow, and you will still have all the problems that Agile was created uh, to battle. So mm. uh, uh, th that's what I'm, I'm, I was missing, basically. I saw this slide, but I didn't understand how it relates to software architecture. Do you have any any hints on software architecture? Uh, and so I didn't see it addressed. Th that's my mm -hmm. point. I, I get you. It's a lot of things in, in this slide, uh, and I skipped it through because uh, the time was limited. Uh, the idea is that architecture, in, in some way, uh, is is a, a complex problem in software uh, development in in general or a complex is a complex problem uh, so we need to to attack it in a way that uh, we can of course plan for for a bit forward but if we plan for the whole thing then we won't be able to uh, to we we don't know the end goal of our, our architecture so if we try to in the beginning to plan then we need to change our plan in the end. So if we spend a lot of time on making uh, a platform, for instance, of architectural platform that we are going to use later on, then the whole uh, business market change and we need to do something else. Then we have spent a lot of time doing something that is not needed. So instead we try to make uh, small chunks of, uh, of our the architecture needed for, for actually creating the value in the short span. Platform is that if you have uh, created a platform that can is easy to change based on your business value. So the platform wha and what's in the platform is actually not made by the developers. It should be made by the customer and the salespeople, and uh, so they should drive this. What should the platform contain? So if you have that, then you don't need to refactor offer wi often, which is something you mentioned in the beginning. And I also kind of disagree. Mm -hmm. So you should refactor until you get a just barely good enough system for the things that matter. Uh, but I, for the platform, I think it's important to get a nice platform that is uh, consistent with the business values that you're after. And if the business values change, then of course your platform changes. Uh, so that, that, that is why I pointed the arch architecture, software architecture, that you can change things easily and fast. I think uh, so uh, we agree with each other, each other, but we can maybe talk about that afterwards. Sure. More questions? Hi. So, Hi. Um, how would you make people who? Um, uh, how do you make everyone work in an agile environment? Because I guess if some people don't want to do that, yeah, it's very difficult to get it to work. And um, it's quite often that you can see certain individuals that uh, prefer working alone mm -hmm. and also by themselves. And they, yeah. So, so I guess that that's that's an issue that I often see. Uh, how do you combat that issue? Like. That is uh, basically my job. I can try to, <laughs> to explain, but uh, so basically, do you to are you talking about people inside of the development team? Usually, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. So developers, uh, what I try to do is usually uh, to get them to see what am I, what am I work actually contributing to? What are we supposed to? What are we trying to do? 
if uh, and try to find their own inbuilt motivations and uh, then I can present tools to them to to help them achieve those goals uh, mostly those uh, tools could be agile in some way or uh, or they could uh, be helped by uh, for instance learning new stuff most developers try want to learn new stuff uh, from someone else by working in a team that is uh, the most efficient way of doing that so um, it's not a totally complete answer, but trying to find their own motivations and try to to build on them uh, to make a good good team is a good start. I think because uh, normally what I see in a good team is when people have opinions. Yeah, and um, that's not that often that you see that. Is there also something you can give like an input? How do you make people actually contribute to your working environment, not just in lines of code, but actually more of them on a higher abstract level, so to say? Yeah, the there are several different reasons why people won't contribute. The most normal I've seen is that they are scared of losing their uh, their face, or uh, they uh, they are losing their status or some sort, or actually losing their job in a very insecure environment. So try to create an environment where it's actually okay to fail is a good start, I think, to to allow people. So if you are uh, some sort of lead developer or something, try to to show up that uh, okay I fail sometimes I do mistakes uh, and then try to discuss those openly in the group and try to find solutions to them uh, because people will start to share themselves uh, share their own personality and their own uh, authentic selves on the work in the workplace if they think it's safe enough so try to create some sort of psychological safety I think more questions All right. Thanks, David. Thank you very much.